today on the Perception in Action podcast, the final episode in my series looking at the contributions of J.J. Gibson to the study of perception in action. Where does the ecological approach stand now? What evidence is there to support it? What are some of the challenges it still faces? So it's time for a call to action. Hi, everyone. This is Rob Gray from Arizona State University and PerceptionAction.com. Welcome to the Perception and Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. In today's episode, I want to try to bring some of the ideas I've been discussing together, look at some of the research that has examined Gibson's ideas in the context of sports, and consider some of the challenges that have been posed to the ecological approach to perception and action. To begin with, I want to review the core ideas I've discussed over the last couple episodes. It is obvious that skillful performance involves a relationship between skillful perception and skillful action. No one would argue that. However, there has been a heated debate with regards to the nature of this relationship. One side of the debate sees perception as an indirect process where meaning is attached to meaningless sensory information via detailed internal representations. In this approach, perception of the environment and action within the environment are separate processes mediated by internal representations. This cognitive approach also places a heavy emphasis on past experience and memory that is related to a particular task. This task-specific information is stored as a representation in our memory and is recalled to influence our actions. Expertise, according to this approach, is a result of having a more elaborate task-specific knowledge base. The main critique of this approach is that it does not seem well-suited to explain the consistent, skillful performance under variable conditions and short time constraints we see in sports. Time is needed to recognize snapshot patterns in the environment recall similar patterns from a stored bank of previously experienced patterns in memory, organize an action by executing an if-x-then-do-y rule, and then finally carrying out the action. The other side of this debate, which I've been describing in the last two episodes, supports the notion of direct realism, a philosophical concept which assumes that what you see is what there is. This concept proposes that the relationship between perception and action is not indirect, and is not mediated by internal representations, but is instead direct. That is, a circular relationship exists between perception and action, which should be considered as the relationship between an organism and its specific environment. Thus we get the ecological approach. The ecological approach emphasizes the role of information in the environment in shaping actions, rather than focusing on internalized knowledge structures. This conceptualization negates the need for mediating internal representations in the relationship between perception and action, and thus seems better suited to explain skillful behavior in highly temporally constrained environments like that of sport. In his ecological approach to perception and action, Gibson emphasizes the mutuality of an organism and their environment by proposing that information is specific to action-related environmental properties and perception is specific to that information. Within our environment, we have information which directly specifies surface layouts, for example, the slant of a field, objects, for example, an opponent versus a teammate, and events, for example, an approaching object or a set play in sports. Event perception is an aspect of Gibson's work that I haven't really covered yet in the series. An event is an occurrence that involves a change over time. Events cause changes in the optic array, with some of these changes having structure and being invariant to the properties of the environment. For example, consider the event of a defender stepping into a passing lane to intercept a ball. Whenever one object, the defender, passes in front of another, the receiver, along the line of sight, dynamic occlusion occurs, in which portions of the far object's surface are occluded at the leading and trailing edges of the near object. Thus, even seemingly complex events that many would argue must involve some sort of cognitive process to interpret are directly specified by information in the optic array. The lawful relationships between the environmental properties associated with objects, surfaces, and events and the associated optic array gives rise to affordances, opportunities for action, directly specified by the information. For example, the event I just described 
defender stepping in a passing lane, gives rise to invariant dynamic occlusion information, which changes the affordance from passability to non-passability. In this direct approach, expertise differences primarily reflect differences in the information variables upon which performers rely, rather than differences in task-specific internal knowledge structures, as would be argued in the indirect cognitive approach. That is, novice and expert attunement to information variables is likely to differ, and this could offer an explanation as to the superior decision-making performance of expert athletes. The final difference between these two approaches I want to emphasize is the nature of decision-making processes involved in each. In the indirect approach, decision-making is a very discrete, linear process. It involves a sequence of clear steps, recognizing a familiar pattern in the game, matching the pattern with a stored internal representation, then finally selecting a course of action from a stored bank of possibilities. On the surface, this conceptualization does not seem to allow for the dynamic and unique nature of every new sporting scenario an athlete faces. In direct perception theory, a decision is a result of directly perceiving affordances from the environment at any given moment of time, defined by invariant sources of information which will culminate in the selection of a prospective action given the set of environmental conditions and the action capabilities of the performer. So in other words, decisions emerge from the continual regulation of action. They are not discrete points in time where the athlete pauses and decides what to do now by selecting from a menu of possible actions. As Gibson stated, we must perceive in order to move, but we must also move in order to perceive. In sport, we are constantly engaging in exploratory behavior through a continuous cyclical relationship between perception and action. Decisions from this perspective can be seen as emerging from, rather than being selected through, the successful perception of what the environment affords at a given moment of time, perceptual processes, and what the actor is capable of doing, action capabilities. Okay, with this basic review in hand, let's look at some of the research evidence in support of Gibson's ideas and some of the challenges that have been raised. As I discussed back in episode 120, when looking at calibration, research has shown that we can perceive a variety of different affordances with a high degree of accuracy. These include step-on ability, step-across ability, sit-on ability, reach ability, pass-through ability, and pass-under ability. In evaluating the accuracy of the perception of these affordances, two basic categories have been considered. Body-scaled affordances, in which the relationship between some measurable dimension of the person's body in relation to an associated property of the environment determines whether an action is possible. For example, a person's leg length relative to the height of a step. And the second, action-scaled affordances, in which how the animal can behave relative to the environment For example, how fast a person can arrive at some location or how much force they can produce with their muscles determines whether an action is possible. I talked a lot about body-scaled affordances and how they might be achieved, for example, by using eye heights as units, back in episode 120. So today I want to focus on action-scaled affordances. The perception of action-scaled affordances is critical to successful performance in sports. Consider an example from volleyball. When a ball approaches the net, the defender has to decide what action to undertake, to jump and block, or to retreat and dig the ball to prevent it falling on their side. It is thus highly important for the volleyball player to perceive when a ball affords blockability and when it does not. When this affordance changes, we have an action boundary. Performing a volleyball block involves both kinematic, reach height of the actor, and kinetic demands, the actor's jumping ability. In other words, to accurately perceive the affordance of blockability, the player needs to take into account their dynamic action capabilities. This exact situation was researched in a study by Pepping and Lee, published in 1997. The study addressed two questions. Are players able to perceive their action boundaries in blockability? And if so, what actor-related property can account for their ability to perceive blockability? Eleven experienced volleyball players were asked to do two things. 1. Indicate whether a volleyball hung from the ceiling would be blockable at that height. In this task, a simple up-down staircase was used to determine the maximum blockable height. That is, if the participant indicated it was blockable, the ball was moved higher, if not lower. The second thing they were asked to do was actually perform a block on balls served at different heights. 
Finally, the mass and height of each participant was measured so that jump impulse could be calculated. What was found? First, with regards to the accuracy of perceiving the affordance of blockability, there was a strong positive correlation between perceived maximum block height and actual maximum block height, with a correlation of 0.77, indicating that players were highly accurate. Participants had a tendency to slightly overestimate, by about 3%, their ability to block. Note that this overestimation is within half the diameter of a volleyball, so it still produced successful behavior. What action-related properties accounted for this impressive ability to judge blockability? Was it a simple relationship based on height, where taller players all perceived a higher maximum block height? No, there was no significant relationship between either height or weight alone and the perceived maximum block height. There was, however, a significant relationship, a correlation coefficient of 0.71, between impulse and perceived blockability. That is, players that could generate a greater impulse had a higher perceived maximum block height. So in this case, players do seem to scale the visual information about ball height using their action capabilities. Another example of this can be seen in the ability to perceive the catchability of a fly ball. In 1996, Udigen and colleagues conducted a study in which they projected tennis balls into the air in front of or behind a participant, varying flight duration and landing location. Participants were instructed to either judge whether or not the ball was catchable or actually attempt to catch it. They found that judgments of catchability closely corresponded to actual catchability, provided that the fielders were allowed to move for a brief one-second period before making the judgment. Unfortunately, there have not been a lot of other studies that have examined the perception of affordances in the context of sport. For those that might be interested, I talked about another example back in episode 63, when looking at the affordance of strikeability in the martial art of kendo. I'll obviously be diving into more research related to these topics on future episodes, but I next want to move on to looking at some challenges that have been raised for the ecological approach. Of course, given the revolutionary nature of Gibson's ideas, it's not surprising that they have received many challenges and criticisms over the years. I could easily devote a series to covering these, but instead I just want to highlight a few that have resonated with me. Challenge number one, where are all of the invariants? In almost any article or textbook that discusses invariants, you will likely be presented with one of two examples. Tau, which can be used to control interaction with approaching objects, and the focus of expansion, which can be used to control the direction of self-motion. While part of this choice has to do with the fact that they're both relatively easy to explain, it's also the case that there are not many others that have been identified. Let me give you an example from the sport I study, baseball. One of the problems that baseball batters have to deal with, that has come to light in recent years with the improved ability to measure the flight of the ball, is dealing with spin. Consider the case of a pitcher that throws an 87 mile an hour fastball. If this pitch is thrown with a backspin rotation rate of 2400 RPMs, it will result in a pitch that crosses the plate 2.75 inches higher than the same pitch thrown with an 1800 RPM rotation rate. For reference, the width of a typical baseball bat at the sweet spot is only 2.5 inches, so this is a pretty large difference. If the batter does not take into account the difference in ball trajectory due to spin, they're not going to be successful in hitting. So how do batters deal with this? In talking with hitting coaches and players, the answer I get most commonly is that players are instructed that when they're going to face a pitcher with an above average spin rate, they should try to hit the top half of the ball. This is an answer I think would make Gibson roll over in his grave. These batters are using a highly indirect cognitive strategy. Instead of controlling their swing based on specifying information, they are essentially using a simple trick to correct for the use of non-specifying information. In Gibson's view, there should be a higher order invariant information source that accurately specifies the height of the ball will cross the plate regardless of its spin rate. But what is this invariant, and how do we educate a batter's attention to it? I'm not saying that such information sources don't exist, just that in practice it has been more difficult to identify clear invariant information sources like Gibson described with the focus of expansion and David Lee described with Tau. The promise of these early discoveries has not really been followed through, in my opinion. It's also the case that even Tau and the focus of expansion have been challenged. 
as there are large bodies of work in both areas, some of which I've contributed to, which attempt to demonstrate we do not regulate our actions solely based on these variables. So in a nutshell, Gibson's idea of invariance, which seemed to be such a simple and elegant solution to the problem of the variation in the retinal image, has turned out to be a bit more complex and hard going than we originally thought. Challenge number two, do we really need affordances? I mentioned in my last episode that the concept of affordances is one that I've struggled to connect with my own work for many years. Here's my issue. If we're continuously regulating our behavior on the basis of specifying information sources, is it really necessary that we perceive affordances? Or is the information itself enough? Consider the volleyball example I described a few moments ago. When the opposing team serves the ball, a frontline player needs to regulate their movement towards the net based on information from the ball flight, presumably time to contact and direction of motion and depth information. Given that the same information is used to time the jump at the net to block the ball, as is to retreat and play the ball off the net, does control of the action really require a stage where they perceive blockability or non-blockability? Is this discrete perception of an affordance necessary for the control of action? As a more concrete example, consider Fagin and Warren's model of locomotion, which I discussed back in episode 88 when looking at the constraints-led approach. In their model, a walker's route through an environment is determined by the interaction between attractors, the goal they're trying to get to, and repellers, obstacles in their way. This interaction leads to sometimes cutting in front of an obstacle, while other times it involves walking a bit further and going behind it. But at no time does the model involve the walker perceiving an affordance of cut in front ability. In Bill Warren's 2006 paper, The Dynamics of Perception and Action, where he describes how this approach can be used more broadly, guess how many times the word affordance appears? Zero. For me, understanding how we couple our actions to information sources has been more powerful and explanatory than trying to carve up the world into affordances by adding the word ability to the end of other words. I also have kind of an uneasy feeling about studies which have investigated the perception of affordances, like the volleyball and fly ball ones I mentioned a few moments ago. In these, participants are asked to make a passive, verbal statement about whether or not they could perform some action. In other words, perception and action is decoupled in these experiments. Maybe my view is just a consequence of the tasks I study where the actor is not faced with a large number of decisions. This is something I'm still thinking a lot about, my view is still evolving, so I'll be talking about it more in future episodes. Challenge number three, how do we learn? If we accept that moving from being a novice to an expert involves a transition from using lower order non-specifying variables to using higher order specifying ones, a difficult challenge for the ecological approach has been to explain how we get from A to B. If skill acquisition is not guided by some internal knowledge or hypothesis testing process, how do we move from using one information source to another? According to Gibson, affordances are usually perceivable directly without an excessive amount of learning. Kind of a vague statement. How can we learn to directly pick something up? Learning in the ecological approach is something that has been primarily tackled by David Jacobs from the University of Madrid. In his theory of direct learning, which I discussed back in episode 53, David argues that learning can also be direct because there's information for learning. In a nutshell, for any action we want to perform, there are a set of possible lower order non-specifying information sources we could use. If we put each of these variables on the axis of a graph together, they form an information space. Consider a really simple example of making a left turn in front of an oncoming car possible lower order variables we could use to decide whether or not the situation affords turn in front ability are the car's angular size or its rate of expansion. Note, these are non-specifying because if we always turned when a car looks small, we would have accidents with cars traveling very fast and with motorcycles perhaps. While if we always turned when the rate of expansion was low, which means the car's speed is low, we would have accidents with cars that are very close to the intersection. If we create an information space with angular size on one axis and the rate of expansion on the other, then different points in space represent different combinations of these two variables. 
David's proposal is that at each point in space, we can calculate how informative that particular combination of variables is about the property we need to control our action. This creates instability in the space, where combinations that are not informative repel us, and combinations that are informative attract. So the process of learning is a continuous movement through this information space towards stable attractors, which represent higher order specifying variables. In other words, changing the variables we use to control our actions does not require any cognitive inference because there is information in the environment, information for learning, which guides the process. In my driving example, using just the angular size for perceiving turn in frontability would not be very informative, so it would cause us to move in the information space towards a combination of angular size and rate of expansion. In other words, tau. Does direct learning theory hold water? On the surface, there are a couple of problems with it. First, again, it's not as easy to carve the world up into lower order variables and information spaces as it might seem. And second, in practice, including some of the work I've done, change in the use of information sources seems to be more abrupt rather than a continuous movement through information space. But either way, I think this is an idea that has some promise and still needs to be explored more. Challenge number four, do we have any agency? Gibson's direct perception theory is often incorrectly classified as being deterministic. That is the idea that invariants and affordances push and pull us around the world. Because they are directly perceived, we do not have a choice in whether or not we respond to them. In other words, we have no agency. This is actually the exact opposite of what Gibson was trying to convey. In many ways, his theories were a counter to the deterministic stimulus response theories of his time. He conceived of the environment not as a collection of stimuli that pushes the animal around, but instead as an array of opportunities. Quote, affordances do not cause behavior, but constrain or control it, end quote. In other words, actions are not caused by the environment or elicited by stimuli, but are the animal's means to utilize the affordances in the environment. But this raises the opposite problem. If affordances are opportunities or possibilities for action, and a single object can afford multiple different actions, how do we choose which affordance to act upon? Do we need to bring in more cognitive concepts like motivation and intention to explain why we utilize certain affordances and not others? I don't want to go into this too much, but if you're interested, I'll point to two attempts to address this issue. First, there's Reed's conceptualization of intention in an ecological framework, which was picked up later in the education of intention idea that I've talked about a few times on the podcast. Also, an interesting newer idea proposed by Rob Withigan and colleagues is that particular affordances invite behavior while others do not. Link in the show notes for a paper going into detail about this idea. So to sum up this episode and this series, we can see there are still a lot of challenges and questions to be addressed with Gibson's direct perception and affordance theories. Some may argue that similar issues are not present with cognitive theories, but again, I would caution everyone to be careful of illusory parsimony. If we think back to the baseball spin example I gave, it might seem like a fairly straightforward explanation would be that the batters have a stored memory for what a typical 87 mile an hour fastball looks like, This causes an anticipation about a certain trajectory, which is inaccurate. But think of all the details we would need to really understand this process. Where does this memory template come from? Is it based on spin rate they see most commonly in practice? Or do we have an internal model of gravity that we apply to all objects? Why does it not get updated with experience facing a specific pitcher? Etc. and so on. The direct perception approach sets a higher bar for itself, because it requires we identify the specific information sources that are being used and how they are coupled to specific aspects of the control of action. We can't just point to vague internal processes. So I think it's going to take some time to develop a full understanding of the complex actions involved in sports using this approach. In terms of Gibson's contributions, while we might quibble about some of the details, there are two that have stuck with me throughout my career. First, the importance of understanding the information that is available in the environment. As both coaches and researchers, I think it's critical that we always think about the stimulus we're presenting to a person. Are we unintentionally making non-specifying information sources useful for the control of action? Are we giving athletes ample opportunity to experience the natural variation of information, 
so that things like the effect of spin rate on ball flight can potentially be accounted for. My second major takeaway from Gibson is the mutuality and coupling between perception and action. As I've said several times in the podcast, understanding this point is what inspired me to use simulation and VR for most of my research. Okay, that's it for today's episode. Remember, you can contact me at robgray at asu.edu or on Twitter at shakyweights. To find out more about the podcast, please check out perceptionaction.com. Finally, to support the podcast and receive bonus materials, including an extra monthly episode and written transcripts, please head over to patreon.com forward slash perception action. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now and keep them coupled. Now you're the 